Good evening and greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Anthony, for that lesson. Say the number one fear is public speaking. Makes you a little flippy in your stomach. So. Um, also, it was interesting. Um, I thought of Ivan Steinauer. He said about a, a preacher one time said that when he went into the pulpit, he was cool as a cucumber. I would say, nah, you don't go into it that way. You go into it in the fear of the Lord. You recognize your dependency on the Lord to share. Also, I thought about the different associations we make. Every time somebody reads Colossians 3, I think of my father-in-law, Harold Martin. This is what he told me. Somebody asked you to have devotions, and you can't think of anything, you can always use Colossians 3. It's always there for you. Colossians 3 will always be there. And so I, I think of that every time. And I appreciate your comment, John. I preached a sermon on setting our affections on things above. And I believe it is a deliberate and a willful choice. And there was a visitor there. He said, that sounded too much like work. So whatever. So. Tonight, I'd like to share a message. The title of my message is Let Her Be Veiled. I'm not much for poetry. I don't like poetry because it never made sense to me. But, you know, can't you feel something out of that poem? And I could never feel it. When I get to the poem section in the literature book, I sort of pass over. Sorry about that, John, but that's the way I look at poetry. But there's one poem that comes to my mind a lot, and I think about that. And that's Robert Frost's poem about two roads diverged in a yellow woods. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. <clears throat> and sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler along. I stood and looked down one as far as I could, could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps a better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that passing there, had warned them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay. In leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubt if I shall ever come back. And I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And I guess when I learned later that he wasn't even talking about Christianity, he was talking about his being a poet. Sort of disappointing. But I'm going to, that's what poetry is. You can take from it what you want. So I'm going to take from it. It's, it intrigues me, this poem. And I guess it's because i faced that fork in the road so often. Decisions that I had to make and look down that road as far as I can see where it bent into the underbush. You can't see the outcome of that. You can't see where that's going to come out. And I know as a Christian, we walk by faith. And my, what, has been a real blessing in my life has simply said, this is what Jesus said. This is what I'm going to do. I don't always understand it. To me, that's what I see here. I can't see where it's all going to lead, but it's a, it's a walk of faith and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that it has made all the difference for me. And again, we have that examples in Hebrews in Hebrews, of individuals who, by faith, believed in God. They didn't know where it would all come out, but it came out in a good way. And that's what I want to tonight to declare to you, God's faithfulness and obedience to his command, his teaching, and what he has um, for all of us. Simply obey his word. If you don't understand it, just do what he says. When I went to school, back in 
Back in grade school, they had these charts about population from way back and how that went like this, and then boom, like this. Population explosion. And if you hear those, see those charts, there would be starvation in the world because there wouldn't be enough food and just be overrun with people. That was a scary thought to me. And then when I got married, the stigma from society about having children. And it would be nice if it was just from society, but it came from your own church people at times. And it's been interesting now, when I think about China's one-child rule, Several years ago, they took that off and said you could have two. And now they're saying you can have three. And now I just read they're going to remove all restrictions. Well, they're going to experiment with it in a certain section and by 2025 maybe remove all restrictions. Their uh, birth rate is like 1.6 and it's not even replacing their population. And they're worried about their economic growth. And I think the United States is at the same place. I think it's 1.67. Now listen, what a blessing I've been to society. <laughs> I'm saying. Do they realize? Just take God's way. It'll prove itself to be the finest way there is. You can't improve on what God says. He makes a comment in the poem there. Yet knowing how the way leads on to way, I doubt if I ever will come back again. And that's an interesting comment. And I received an article in the mail from an individual. And I'm going, this, this struck me in a real way. And I'm going to uh, draw this on the board. He's talking about watershed issues. It was the late Francis Schaeffer, and he had climbed to the certain high ridge in Switzerland and observed the unified snow cover across the top. This is a ice cap, snow cap on top. This unity would later be put to the test as the temperature warms and the snow melts. The melt reveals the rest of the story, the revelation of the watershed principle. On one side of the ridge, the melted snow, as it melts, it runs down here. Makes its way down the Rhine, flows north through Germany, and ends up in the cold waters of the North Sea. But the melt just over the other edge of the ridge makes its way down into Lake Geneva, then to the Rhone River, down through France, and into the warm waters of the Mediterranean. From a distance practically imperceptible, right here at the top, a unified togetherness, these waters end up literally a thousand miles apart. Are there any issues that you've seen in life that are watershed issues? Where we're together here, it separates us and miles apart. Some of these are probably my views from my perception, but as I looked at the Mennonite church, the churches that got television never came back, and today we're a thousand miles apart. This article was written about the internet and the article has to do, and I, I'm convinced that if we don't take some steps to guards, it will become a watershed issue and we will end up miles apart. This is not my subject. But as I, I thought about this, I was talking to my old order friend, just someone I know, and I was talking about watershed issues and I told him, I said, I suppose you think that the 
car is a watershed issue. Oh, my, yes, he said. And then I said, well, do you think we're 1,000 miles apart? He was too kind to say we were. Well, he said in church. And then I left it go with that. I wasn't going to press the issue. I didn't think we were 1,000 miles apart. I told him that I went, I had associate friends in churches that I said on, on some of these issues, like the television, that we were of the sort of the main mindset, but today they don't even hold the non-resistance. They don't hold the right views of marriage, and they don't even um, hold to the head covering. Well, he said, they don't call themselves Christian, and that's where I just stopped. They call themselves very Christian, and we're a thousand of miles apart on these watershed issues. To me, the veil is very much of a watershed issue. And tonight, what I'd like to do is somehow convince you of the truth of that matter. And I guess my, my grief is how easily that, thing, that is, veil is tossed as unimportant, doesn't really mean a whole lot, and it's not necessary. You can stand there and look down that road. When you decide to get rid of that veil, you have no clue where you're headed on that thing. And what I still walk by faith, but I've, I'm older now, and when I look back, it's more serious to me, a whole lot more serious to me than it was in my younger years. And what I'm trying to share to you is what I've seen from my end of the road and where you are at, and I think too often it's so um, easily gotten rid of. A picture will come in. What happened to her veil? Where is she? Do they realize where they're going? Do they realize what is going to happen? I think that um, and now that I can... And there was a time in my own life when I was, I'm ashamed to say it, but I was about half embarrassed of my mom and my sisters. Nobody else wore veils. We were strange. We were different. But I've come to see it. We need to recognize that this is the stuff that's holding society together. And it's more than just the veil. And I want us to somehow to be fully persuaded, and I guess in my mind, I, I wonder how many people still are not fully convinced of it and embarrassed about wearing one. And my goal, I guess, is to help us to see how extremely important it is. What, I guess, what has It's more than just a veil. It has to do with God's order. And as I ponder this thing, and it was shown to me years ago, that probably when we would talk about divorce and remarriage, that one would be more important in our minds than the veil. But a misunderstanding of the veil simply leads to divorce and remarriage, broken homes, and all the chaos that we're seeing in society. Do we realize how valuable it is? This is not a Mennonite doctrine. This is not just our little idea. This is God's design from the very beginning. This has to do with God himself. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 8 and 9 this has nothing to do with the fall. It has nothing to do with that. He says, For the man is not of the woman, but of the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. This is God's order for all society. This is the way it needs to be. God's order... <clears throat> Verses 1 to 3, 1 Corinthians 11, 
Be you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Now this is the order. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is a man, and the head of Christ is God. That is God's order. And I had my marker in there where I wanted to read. Esther is one of the hardest books to find. <laughs> but this is an order that is from the beginning. And as we look at um, different cultures and different societies, I like to read, this had to do with Ahasuerus. And this always stood out to me. I don't think he was any more Jewish origin. It was, it was of heathen people. And when King Ahasuerus asked Vashti to come into him and show off her beauty, she refused. So he got all these wise men in, and I went to read it, and Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. This order was well understood in that culture. It's very important. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise her husband in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Now listen to this. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. There is an order that must be, or it will society will fall apart. And we're seeing that in our time. That order has been destroyed. Do we realize? how important this order is of God's design. There are times when, when we look at what we call heathen nations, and this particular order is more intact than in our Christian America. And again, as I look down that road, it doesn't always make sense. I don't always understand it. We don't need to. We simply need obedience to Christ. There was a young man going to a church where not everyone wore the head veil. And his father challenged him on it. And this is what his, what his answer was to his father. It's more important for the wife to be submissive than to just wear the veil. And this is what his father told him. If you don't keep the practice, you won't keep the principle. And that was 40 years ago, and it has proven to me very strongly that you won't keep that principle. Wear it and attempt to live it out. Live out what it stands for. There was a lady that I did a job for. And this was interesting because she's from a very plain people and she's very, very loud. And you would get the impression she's very, very bossy. But it's interesting, sometimes we'll make our judgments too quickly. It's interesting how that as I learned to know her, she's a very kind lady, she's a very submissive lady. So let's take, be careful in our judgment, but it is uh, sometimes the individual who does not want to wear the head covering will look at individuals that wear it and say, see, it doesn't really matter that you wear it because you're not doing it. 
We need to be in obedience to Christ, what he teaches, and simply wear it. I'd like to look at some of the evidence of an outer order uh, headship, some of the results, and try to make some connections so that you can see how this works out. We struggle with cause and effect of knowing why do things happen a certain way. Sometimes we'll blame things on, on certain things and it's not the real problem. Here's a young man that's involved in drug, alcohol, moral corruption. The miserable soul, why? Why? You'd be amazed at how many people from the prison have said, yeah, my grandmother used to wear one of them. It's amazing how many people had connection. Was it because they threw that away that caused a broken home? I was involved with a, a church in a very slight way, in, in a very small way, from a distance, and we would have considered them slightly liberal church, not from this area. And I guess this was one of the lessons that I learned from that whole experience. And as I was, the individual that I was conversing with had been a part of a church that was, would have been considered dead and legalistic. But when he got to that church, the thing that he observed and was came through to him very clear how much it was out of order, how much the women ran the church how much the women were in charge of things. And it was just interesting to me how that, that affects what happens within the church. Society has put a lot of pressure on us as to women's role in different things. I read of a church that had an ordination and everybody from 18 years and up, each had a ballot. Men and women had a ballot for the ordination, which was one thing, but the comment was made that the husband and wife should not discuss with each other which one they were choosing. And I, I didn't, I don't remember who it is, but I thought, how can this be? Surely the husband and wife could discuss it, together decide, and let the husband choose. And this is another, I don't know why I put this in here. This was for Ed, so maybe he already knows the story. This is history from Strasburg Church. <laughs> and it's no reflection on Strasburg. He probably already knows the story. But in about 1947, 48, I don't know, the government took over in Letterkenny where the Strasburg Church was, and they were chased out of there. Well, I don't think it was a very big church, and sort of the, I guess the bishops, the head people said, they think maybe Strasburg members should just disperse and go to Chambersburg, Pleasant View, or wherever. And so it was given to the Strasburg church to vote on it as to whether they wanted to keep Strasburg church or just disperse. And they were a bit concerned they didn't have enough votes, and so they got the women to help vote, and it passed. <laughs> and so this brother was telling me, he says it was the women that decided to keep Strasburg Church. I don't know why I'm telling you that story. It's no reflection on Strasburg. I think they did all right. But I'm sorry, ladies. I think the men should run the church and make decisions on church policy and that kind of thing. One of the clear evidences and this came from that other church of a out of order situation has to do with the modesty issue. I can see that more and more clearly that when modesty falls apart, there's an out of order situation there in that. God made them male and female. God made them perfect but he made them different. And I'm not sure how to 
share all this. And I think sometimes it's a, a bit of a, a difficult subject, and so we don't talk about it. And, and I don't think that men always understand how women think. And I don't think women always understand how men think. But God made us with certain feelings and emotions and mindsets that are a bit different. And it's sometimes it's a little hard to communicate how that happens. So I share on this subject of immodesty. This is not a question... Um, I'm not placing the blame on the men or the women. I'd like to simply look at each one's responsibility in this situation. There are men that tend to be gun-shy about rebuking immodesty because they will be labeled corrupt, perverted, and maybe even a, a rapist. Sad to say that even in church life, the accusation came through when a comment came up about some immodesty. Well, you're just looking at the women too much and you should quit it. Men, we're responsible to see what's going on and what's happening and take a stand on the position that we need to. There was a famous talk show lady, a woman, that said, she said a woman should be able to walk down the street without clothes and without any fear. She's dead wrong in her thinking. She's wicked in her thinking. That woman is inviting trouble and corrupting men's minds. She's dead wrong in her thinking. And if I would have heard it from her, I would have rebuked her. And if I would have rebuked her, you know what she would have said to me? You're the one that's corrupt. You're the one that's rapist. You're the one that's a pervert. Listen, that's because they don't understand a man's thinking. And sometimes the women can think that the men are totally perverted. Sometimes I look at women in the way they dress and I think they're perverted. I think there's a, it's stupidity. They don't understand. I don't think they understand. God created man to take the leadership role because man understands some of these issues better than women understand. Not to say that women don't totally understand it. And a man that is under Christ desires moral purity. See the headship order? As a man, he understands that which is essential, that which is Modest, he is responsible to declare it to his wife, his daughter, and counsel in the church. He must declare it, this is what is right and this is what is good. And if he fails to declare it, he's responsible. And there's verses in the Old Testament, I'm not going to look at them, which says that if a wife says something, and he's not there, she's responsible, and if he comes and he doesn't say anything against it, then he's responsible. And if they're there together and she says something wrong and he doesn't rebuke it, he's the one that's responsible and she's not. Catch all that thinking? If the wife does not understand she's modest because you haven't told her and you haven't explained it to her, it's your problem. And of course, the, the question, as so I thought about these different angles, the question of where the men are and the kind of force they should put into this thing, you know, how serious is it? And I thought of the story of, these are stories again that intrigue me. There was a bishop that was passing out communion, and the lady had her hair hanging down the back with a little carving on her head, and he refused to give her communion. And he had a mess on his hand. She was weeping, and other women were weeping, and it was just a big mess. And you would have thought there could have been a more um, diplomatic way of dealing with this. And maybe he had told her earlier, I don't know. One thing about it, you knew where he was on this issue. 
no misunderstanding here. It was very clear. There was another man, and I don't know if he had communicated this to her either, and this might even be a story, but I heard it. She was not to wear white shoes on her wedding day. She came on her wedding day with white shoes on. She got married without any shoes on. She had to take them off. And I, I think, again, was that very diplomatic? Me, I would probably say, well, let's just slide through this one and go on. They knew exactly where he stood on these issues. No confusion. And sometimes maybe we're not clear as to where we're at, and the message isn't always clear. Any wife or daughter that knows that her husband or father doesn't like her outfit, doesn't like how she's dressing, and she doesn't care, that is direct rebellion against Christ, a God. That's, that's God's order, and that's God's design. You might think Dad has some of these dumb, funny ideas. Now listen, he is your father, and he is designed to give you clear direction as to what you need to wear. I see some outfits and I say, that's not a man's thinking. I, I can see that that is her idea of what looks nice. And I see some outfits and I think, he's probably tolerating that because he wants to please her and there's a place for some of that. But listen, let's, as men get clear direction on how uh, what is modest and what, how it should be. If I think about the progression of out-of-order homes, children who are in homes or out-of-order struggle to relate to their spouses. It creates chaos. And again, the idea of immodesty in, in the home creates moral corruption and leads to divorce and remarriage. And again, moral corruption leads to gay marriages. It's interesting that churches are splitting over this area. I just heard that the United Methodist Church split, Southern Baptist split. They're not splitting over divorce and remarriage. They're not splitting because of the head covering. How did they get to where they're at? It's because they lost God's order from the beginning. It's extremely important. The headship veil clearly demonstrates we believe in God's order and his design on this whole thing. Somehow our thinking does not put it up in the category where it should be. Our thinking, our view, and our attitude about Christianity comes through to our children. We have not carried the kind of weight that we should. The question that always comes up, will there be any women in heaven that didn't wear a covering? Don't ask that question. It's a wrong kind of question to ask. The question is, what does God say about it? Will there be any um, divorced and remarried people in heaven? Don't ask those questions. Will there be any gay marriages, people that are involved in gay marriages in heaven? I don't get any response. I had a friend, the fellow that I was working with, and of course, and I think I told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because it strikes me because we were talking about the headship bail. He wasn't thoroughly convinced of it. And he said, I know a lot of Christian women that don't wear the headship bail. And then we went on, and he knows a lot of Christian men that go to war. And then we went on. He knows a lot of divorced and remarried people that are fine Christians. Well, do you know any involved in a gay marriage that are Christian? Oh, no, that's wickedness. That's horrible. That's not Christian. Listen, 
He's wrong in his thinking. He's wrong in his perception about what it's about. And I think too often we have broadened our perception of Christianity to include too much. We have given to our children signals that I accept this as Christian and it's wide and it's broad. And don't come and ask why don't they see wearing a covering as being important because you've communicated that to them that you can be a Christian without it. It's not really, and I've, I've already said that and I slipped that in pretty hard there. Okay, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? No, it's what the Bible says and we need to embrace it and hold to it. And again, when I see individuals that are throwing off the veil, do you know where you're going to come out? You're going to be a thousand miles from where you should be. You're not going to come out where you want to. It's serious. And can I somehow convince you of that? When I think about years ago, dresses were way too short. It seemed like the trend in society was going longer. And there were men, faithful men in the church that were pressing for longer dresses. And it was just a delight to see dress length getting longer. Beautiful, refreshing, wonderful. I felt like sisters had a solid conviction for it. It's interesting trends in society. It's interesting to move towards dresses. But they're getting shorter. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to maintain? Are we going to stand for what's right? And it's, a, it's been a struggle in my mind as you look at some of this stuff. And I think it's back again to the idea that there is a willful and deliberate choice and effort that has to be put into it. It doesn't just happen. You have godly men and godly women. It should just all work. But when I look, and this is not just for you here at Shippensburg. It's for St. Thomas. It's for the broad, general uh, Mennonite church. The pressure seems to always be there. Dresses want to get tight. Dresses want to get short. Necklines want to get lower than they should be. And why? It's just we're made of flesh. We're human nature. Men, we need to take our stand and say, this is not what we want. Sisters, see the beauty of modesty. See the beauty of listening to your husband's counsel, your father's counsel. Do you realize that sisters that are under their husbands and men that have taken their place, you are the salt and light in our, in our world. You are the strength of our society. You are the thing that helps to hold this thing together. It's flying to pieces. And I've only been in the appliance business for 10 years, but I had so many eye openers. And I guess I just fixed appliances for people that are heathens, I guess. But you wouldn't believe how many people were boyfriend and girlfriend. And we had a couple that moved in right across the street from us, and they're expecting their first child. And he says, this is my girlfriend. Our homes are disastrous. It's, it's a shame. Do we realize what we have? And can we, with a, a bold front to our society, declare, this is what you need to do. Your wife needs to veil her head and submit to her husband and be in order. And husbands, you need to be under Christ in a real way. Things are not going to stay together unless you faithfully follow Christ's teaching. And I said about 
It is a watershed issue. And it sounds like you'll never be back, but if somebody here thinks that the covering's on important and maybe you threw it away, you just need to repent of that and say, this is what Christ says, and, and I invite you to come back. Put the veil on, understand what it means, God's order. And again, God's order is right and good, and the fallout from despising that and not doing it is terrible. And we do not want to follow in that design. Lord bless you.